Oh, great. Okay, John. Well, I had the uh, the honor of serving with your partner yesterday, Kurt Beinfor, for the fixed income investing at Nervine. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked a lot about your firm, and I, I'm very impressed by it. Uh, given, <clears throat> you know, we have lots of different uh, uh, fee-only financial advisors that uh, assist us with the programming here. But um, tell us a little bit about your firm and um, your background and sort of how, you know, how large is your firm? What, what, what are you guys made up of and so forth? Sure. Well, it's nice to be here. Um, I helped found Knightsbridge Wealth Management, our firm, way back nowadays. I can say way back in 1998, so 20-some years ago. Last century, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, we've been assisting clients ever since then with their financial planning, their wealth management, their investments. And that's what we do. We're in Newport Beach and we're managing uh, a little over 500 million in assets for our clients, families and individuals with personal accounts, retirement accounts. My background, uh, you can see on my Ask First form, I'm a chartered financial analyst, which is a good designation if you are wanting to be a professional that does security selection and research, building portfolios where you're actually choosing stocks and bonds and building portfolios uh, from that standpoint. So that's my background is my career has been spent researching investments. It's what I enjoy. And I have a master's degree in finance and an undergraduate degree in economics. Um, we have an investment team here. We all tend to have the same kind of MBAs and CFAs or CFPs to to be prepared to work with clients That's so you have so, so you have uh yeah tell us a little bit because i don't think we've had uh, a cfa present i mean do you spend a lot of time um analyzing companies and and researching and all that uh what, while you're choosing your portfolio for your clients yes and i'll talk a little bit about this as we go through some of the slides i prepared but um in my view, it's helpful for us to be able to build client portfolios, including individual securities. So that means uh, selecting specific bonds and stocks, preferred stocks, common stocks, different kind of bonds, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, whatever is appropriate for each client and their tax situation and their time horizon and so forth. Because if we do that, we avoid lots of layers of fees. You know, an advisor that uses mutual funds, there's a mutual fund fee, there may be transaction costs and the advisor cost. Our model's fairly straightforward in that we charge an annual management fee. It's a declining fee uh, so that clients get rewarded for their loyalty. And that's pretty much it in terms of costs because we're building the portfolios here in house. To be able to do that requires the kind of backgrounds we have where you get your MBA, but, but especially the CFA that's three years of training it's difficult to pass the exams uh, it really does prepare you for the, the the nature of the research to do security selection which is basically financial statement analysis and that's what i spend my days mostly doing is reviewing financial statements so and I, and you're probably going to talk about this in your um in your presentation but you would be considered what we call an active manager or an active um uh, yeah, are, are you you are more in of the philosophy of an active manager rather than a passive uh, right. manager? Right, that's a really good distinction. There's there's different flavors of investing. Active and passive is probably the biggest uh, differentiator of an investment portfolio. I'm a fan of passive investing. Passive means you take what the index gives you, so you're invested in the not so much the Dow Jones Industrial Average, something like the S and P 500. It's tax efficient. It's low cost. Uh, I'm a fan of passive investing, and we do incorporate passive investing in our diversified portfolios. But I'm also here to add value to clients, and uh, I want. Sorry, them I got to. Don, I need you to jump in. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, you know, if a client's paying us a fee, my view is we should be able to do better than just the rate of the overall stock market. So we do incorporate active management, but only in areas where we think we can add value and where areas of the investment markets are maybe a little more inefficient and we can be selective. And um, so we do both active and passive. So, but and if, 
relates to a question that's already been asked. So given the, uh, the Biden bills that are going through Congress and the trillions of dollars that are being uh, spent, is it time to go to gold and at least bonds? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's the first you know, question there, I asked. <laughs> there are always risks. Uh, we are worried about inflation. And right now we have inflation. It's potentially only temporary. The best protection against inflation, the worst is bonds, most bonds. Uh, stocks can be okay to a point. And typically commodities and gold, precious metals, and nowadays Bitcoin offer a lot of inflation protection, as does real estate. So. Um, we include things like real estate exposure and a small hedged gold position, and we're actually contemplating adding Bitcoin to the portfolio because you can do that now through through an exchange traded fund. Um, so I believe in diversification. I, you know, in terms of politics and policies and the bills that are slowly working through different political proposals, um, it's difficult to assess because you know we really don't know what is capable of passing. We have not, and if you go on our website, our third quarter investment commentary, we talk about this. We are not making changes to the investment portfolio based upon the, the potential changes Pending. in laws and, and things. policies yeah. and regula regulations. I don't, I haven't seen anything that leads me to believe whether it's corporate tax or income tax or capital gains tax, um, state tax. I, I don't know that anything dramatic will happen such that it would um, be a reason to take evasive action and avoid the stock market. Okay. The bigger re reason to be interested in the stock market is the economy is very, very strong. Corporate earnings are very strong. And those are the primary drivers of the stock market. Okay. Let me take you back to your ask first for Do you have a minimum that you, that you accept as a client? It's, we have a, we have the same minimum today we had in 1998 and it's $250,000 and a family can even meet that minimum through more than one account. Um, what we added is, you know, wanting to try to help out the next generation of our clients is a $40,000 minimum for clients under age 40 and actually oh. a, a really low fee of 40 basis points for okay. clients okay. under 40. So you give clients a break when they're younger, but generally $250,000. Then what percent? If, let's go back up to the two fifty. What are the what's the fee structure? Because you had said longevity, the fee goes down. Is it also for volume? Right at the million dollar level for a family, we start our fee at one point one percent. Usually we start um, a little bit higher if it's a if it's at that two hundred fifty thousand dollar level. But most clients start at one point one percent, and then every year the fee declines five basis points. So the second okay. year goes from one point one percent down to one point oh five. And the fee declines annually until it's 0.75% annually to, like I said, reward loyalty. And also because after seven years, the portfolio should be larger and we don't need to charge as big a percentage. Right. Do you also help them do a business, a, a estate plan or a pl financial plan in terms of where they are or strictly on the investment side? We get a lot more involved on the tax side. So we, right. we like to work with each client, understand their tax mm -hmm. bracket and employ uh, techniques to really minimize their tax realization. And so that involves how we invest and it can vary from year to year. So we get, we get pretty involved from a, from a tax standpoint, not really from an estate plan, but estate planning standpoint, that's usually the attorney. The one area that you referenced earlier is charitable planning where maybe mm -hmm. there's a charitable remainder trust or unit trust. Um, we, we do model that out and, and think about how best to invest a, a charitable account. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and go on into the presentation and uh, work from there? Sure. So, I, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years plus, and it, I always enjoy it. Um, and, and my focus with my job is, is the stock market. So I, I especially like being able to talk about that through, in a workshop session like this. And that's my focus today is, is stocks, the stock market. I have a lot of slides, a lot of information. I'll run through some of it quickly. And I ask you to pose any questions through the Q&A. If, if something's not clear, do you want me to expand on something? Or you have some tangential question, bring it. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk about anything around investing. But my agenda starts out with finding a stock and why they should be in your portfolio and appropriate vehicles, how best to research and invest in stocks. I want to talk about risks, you know, basically what not to do and what to do to assure a long-term successful uh, uh, portfolio in the, in the stock market, and I'll pick on investment advisors that 
maybe aren't structured as well as I think they should be at the end. Um, but let's start at the beginning, the basics. What is a stock? Um, you know, we heard this past year about day trading and Robinhood, and you know, it's really easy to buy and sell stocks commission free. I that whole world is to me just speculating, and I don't think anyone should do it. Basically, um, you want to be a long-term investor. You want to think about stock as literally owning a share of the business, and that's what a stock is. It's a it's a share of ownership in a business. So if you own ten shares. You know, that's you, you own part of that company and you get a piece of the, the earnings that company produce. And the term equity is used a lot. It's the same thing. It means stocks. So if I say equity or stocks. It's, it's the same. There are two different kinds of stocks, and we typically own both common stocks and preferred stocks. Common stocks are, are about sometimes dividends, but mostly about appreciation. You want to buy a stock, you want it to go up in value over time. Preferred stocks are different. They're, they're typically safer. They're more senior in the capital structure of the company. They get paid back first for the common stock. And they usually pay higher dividends. So it's less about appreciation, more about dividends. We like preferred stocks. I know a lot of investors don't own preferred stocks. But I like them for taxable accounts because they pay dividends that are qualified. And Well, some of them do, the ones we own. Qualified dividends simply means the dividend income you receive is taxed at capital gains tax rates, 15 or 20%, not your high, typically higher income tax rate. So if you're interested in income, we own several preferred stocks that pay 4 and 5% yield that's taxed favorably, which is a lot better than a lot of the bonds we see. So you, you can earn good income in the stock market through preferred stocks. This is one of my very favorite charts. I I like to show it to new clients or, or investors that are kind of new to the stock market because it it shows the growth over a long time since 1900 in the broad U.S. stock market. And the reason I like to show investors this is not just because if they put $10 in the market in the year 1900, they have well over $1,000 uh, today. You know, that's a lot of appreciation. That's part of it. But almost daily, I get asked about something of concern to an investor. What about inflation? What about taxes? Uh, what about the Fed? What about whatever? And you see this chart and you see all the wars and the crises, the different political environments, um, depression, you know, a lot of different things. And the stock market wound its way through, sometimes down, but volatile. But you know, generally the stock market's going to rise. And I can't say that about every year, but when you start thinking about three and five year horizons, the odds are really good you'll, you'll prosper in the stock market. And um, the other thing I like to show on this chart are the, the vertical lines that are gray. Those are recessions. And so a long time ago, we had more recessions. They were longer, more frequent. Um, early in the chart, there was not a Federal Reserve. The, the policies have come into place to help reduce recessions and the length of them. And last year is the best example I can give. Uh, the stock market was down for six weeks with COVID and uh, the government really got into gear and it turned out to be a, a really good year for stocks. We made over 20% last year, it was shocking, but you know, really speaks to the, uh, the economy increasing most of the time and the stock market along with it. Why, does, why do we see this pattern? Why do stocks go up over time? Well, this is the, the, my answer. Uh, going back to 1935, the, the dark blue squiggly line, those are earnings, the S&P 500 and the annual earnings the companies have produced. And there's a trend line there in light blue, and it's at a 6.5% rate. And that's basically the reason why the stock market's gone up eight to 10% a year is you're getting that earnings growth plus dividends. And I see no reason that won't continue. You know, companies will continue to produce earnings and stocks will, will track that. So it's not just a, an accident or uh, only a coincidence of history that the stock market's done so well. It, there's, a, there's a reason and it hasn't changed. And so the best place you can invest in my view, as much as I like real estate, Best returns, I believe, will come from the stock market. So how should you think about stocks? Well, 
they provide growth that I find superior to any other asset class or investment opportunity. They can provide the income I described through dividends. They generally are liquid. You know, stocks trade publicly. You can sell them and have your money in a few days. Certain stocks can provide inflation hedge. I was asked about gold. You know, you can buy a gold miner commodities. Um, you can build different kinds of stock portfolios to achieve different goals. But like I said, I, I think stocks really are a, a way to grow your wealth. And fixed income, the leading alternative stocks, can be fairly risky because if interest rates rise, you can lose money in bonds. And these days, the rate of bond interest is you know, really not capable of even keeping up with inflation, I believe. So that but bonds can be viewed as risky as, as well. There are a lot of different ways you can invest in the stock market. You can buy individual stocks on your own. That's what we do here. We buy individual stocks. You can buy mutual funds. I'm not a fan of mutual funds. They're usually very tax inefficient and they often are too diversified to have any chance of beating the market. And the fact is 90% of all mutual funds have not beaten the market. They're too expensive, too diversified. They trade too much, um, very tax inefficient. You know, if you have a mutual fund portfolio, be happy to review it for you. And I can probably show you how you can improve your costs and, and, and taxation. What has come into the market that I like very much are exchange traded funds. They tend to be passive, not active, meaning they track in an index. They are minimal cost. And because they're passive, they're very tax efficient. So, um, you know, we do utilize exchange traded funds for, for areas of exposure to stock markets, such as overseas sometimes, um, that I, I think an ETF is a good way to gain that exposure. What's you the distinction with, between an indexed fund and an ETF? Yeah, in, and tip, most ETFs are an index fund. There are some that are active, but most, most ETFs mm -hmm. are, are index funds. Okay. You can work with a brokerage firm. Um, you can, you know, we here invest portfolios, but we don't hold the money. We have our clients hold their assets at a discount brokerage firm such as Schwab or Fidelity. That's a good option. And I'm an investment advisor. That means I have a fiduciary duty to my clients. I think I like I like investment advisors as a an entity more than brokerage firms, just as a generalization, because I have an obligation to put my clients' interests first. And I'm regulated with the SEC, and I'm not a fan of variable annuities. They have um, risk and reward, a, a capture rate of the stock market that usually is suboptimal. So you're leaving money on the table if you're a long-term investor in a variable annuity. They do have some tax benefits, but generally they're expensive, and you know I believe you're better off uh, losing the certainty of the variable annuity or some certainty and just going directly into the stock market. And and one note, incidentally, because of the charitable nature that I tend to talk about in these webinars. We're not talking about something like a charitable gift annuity with Chapman or another organization. That's a different kind of annuity. That's a different annuity and that has a place in, in a lot of portfolios. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, a very common way to organize stocks, think about the stock market is what's known as the style box. And Morningstar, which is a good research resource, they track, they categorize stocks into this style box. And it just, it just speaks to two things. For a given stock, is it a large company, mid-sized or small company? And the, and the definition of size is based on uh, the total value of all the stock together, the market capitalization. So you have Tesla now, which is a trillion dollar company, Apple, which is even beyond a trillion. And then you can go down to some smaller companies you're not familiar with that or the total company, all the stock value is only a hundred million dollars, a small cap stock. There's a real range and there's something to be said for diversifying and having some large well-known companies, but also some, some smaller companies that maybe are growing more, more quickly. And that's the other def common definition of the stock market is value versus growth. Value stocks are legacy companies. Maybe they're mature and not growing as much. So ExxonMobil or General Motors, you know, well-established companies that, uh, new entrants are trying to disrupt and some of the younger, smaller companies like a Tesla say, you know, they're new on the scene and they're a growth stock because they're growing faster and everybody knows it. And so the stocks are at a higher valuation and they're more expensive. So this is one way you can think about your portfolio, analyze your portfolio. And if you're all in one of those 
sub boxes, you're probably not diversified. If you only own large companies and they're all, you know, big tech companies, you're not diversified. So when we do reviews of existing portfolios, uh, this is one of the, the aspects of our reviews to, to look at and think about the diversification. I get asked sometimes if we use technicals. Technicals means things about price and volume, signals in the, in the, in the market and how, how stocks are trading. And there's all these patterns people think about, head and shoulders and you know, tops and bottoms and things like that. I don't think any of it works. I don't know any investor that's sustainably managed money and, and grown wealth using technicals. Um, it, it's just not that easy. And so I'm, I'm not encouraging you to spend much time thinking about the, the technicals around stocks. Instead, I think you should think about fundamentals. What, what are fundamentals? That's the valuation of a stock. That's you know how much you pay and what are you getting for your investment in terms of that stock and, and the underlying intrinsic value. And, you, and that's you know a, a big term for stocks is intrinsic value. And, it, and intrinsic value, you can determine it different ways. You can look at the price earnings ratio, the price to book or cash flow, sales, these number three, I have all the different valuation measures that are common. But you can also think about a, a stock, a company, and its future. So in the next 10 or 20 years, what's, what's this business going to do? How much will revenue grow? How much per year will the company generate in earnings or cash flow? And you can discount that back and think about what's that worth to you today as an investor. And that's just another way to think about intrinsic value. So it's, you, you don't necessarily just want to screen on stocks with low price to earnings ratio because you end up sometimes with a lot of bad companies failing poor companies that are not growing. And so it, you know, it's not really simplistic when you try to do fundamental valuation. You have to think about different companies different ways. And that's what we spend most of our, our time doing is thinking about the right way to analyze a given company. I get asked, well, what about the stock market today? It's kind of expensive. It's 20 times earnings. And, um, and how does that relate to history? Well, uh, these charts are interesting on the left, going back a lot of years, it says, well, what is the price earnings ratio? What does the valuation mean for the next year? And on the left side, you don't see much of a pattern. So even though the stock market's 20 times earnings today, I, I can't really tell you what the, the US stock market defined by the S&P 500 index will do in the next year. But over five years, what you pay, the valuation really starts to matter and you see it to the right. So today, with a price earnings ratio of about 20, with that red line to the right, pointing up to what I would say is a, a below average rate of return. And so I think the stock market over the next five years won't do 10% like it's done per year the last five years. I think it'll do more like 5%. And that's because I can see today's valuation and I know the predictive pattern over the next five years. So it does matter what you pay in terms of the valuation over the long term. And you see that blue circle to the bottom right. We want to fish in the pond of, of PE ratios of valuation in the you know, 10 to 20 range because that historically has delivered the 10% type annual return. So um, you should know if, if you have a portfolio of stocks, the valuation. You should know how your stocks are trading today uh, relative to, to earnings and things. How can you research the stock market on your own? You can go to the, the library and you can look up Morningstar. You can look up Value Line. I use both those tools. You know, I'm a professional. We pay pay uh, with a pretty good budget for research, but I, I still use Morningstar and Value Line, and they're available to you free at the library. You can go online. Morningstar is really good for ETFs and mutual funds. Value Line is really good for specific stocks. And the image I'm showing you is a, a one page review of a stock. Literally on one page, you can learn. I think enough to make an investment decision based on that value line. It's a really, really good shortcut tool. I think I need better glasses to read it. Yeah, I know. Um, every investor has their philosophy and I have mine here at Knightsbridge Wealth Management. And that is, you know, we think about risk, not, not just the potential reward, but, but first we think about the risk and I don't really want to make investments in stocks that could go to, to zero where there's a bankruptcy risk. So you have to think about not just the earnings, but the balance sheet and you know the, the position the company's in. And uh, the old saying, you know, worry more about a return of your capital than a return on your capital. 
Philosophically, I also like companies that pay dividends to shareholders because that instills some discipline on the part of management, knowing they have to send cash every quarter to their investors. And it usually implies a profitable company that's doing well if they're able to pay dividends. And I mentioned earlier about valuation number three. You don't just screen for the cheapest stocks. You know, they're oftentimes cheap for a reason and not a good, not a good investment opportunity. So you want to, I, I think, pay a reasonable valuation, get a good company trading at a reasonable valuation, and that's your most likely path for consistent wealth building. And, and we like to buy high quality companies that are compounding their results, they're growing, they're, they're doing really well, at, and buy them at that reasonable valuation. Because in a tax paying account, if I can make that investment and own that stock for 10 years and not have to sell it and pay tax, that's really valuable. You want to be an investor that's generating long-term capital gains, tax rates, and, and invest with a long horizon where you have a multi-year multi -year holding period. And if, if you're not in position to do those things, then my rule at the bottom, go ahead and buy the index. Buy the ETF. Buy the passive S&P 500 index and, and just forget about it. And you'll, you'll do fine over time. Why, why do you want to not pay tax? Why do you want to be a long-term investor? Well, this is just a, a chart that shows if, if you do buy and hold the blue line after 20 years, uh, investing $100,000 and, and making 6% a year, that $100,000 after 20 years is, is compounding away and worth nearly $700,000. But if you're, if you're paying tax and you're selling every two years, you have a lot less because of the, the tax payments, $160,000 less. So I think you have to you have to know not just your rate of return, but what is your after-tax rate of return? We like to share with our investors, you know, not just what did they make, but what did they make after their fee, and what did they make after tax? And a year like last year is my definition of, of success. Sure. Clients had a good rate of return, and they, and they didn't have any taxes due, because when the market was down early in the year, we harvested losses. So, you know, it's not just about what you make, it's about what you keep. And the, and the path to keep the most is to be a long-term investor and, and get to those lower capital gains tax rates and, and defer payment of them by, by holding stocks for, for multiple years. John, I'm going to stop, stop you for a minute. Since Trevor is smiling, my guess is his building inspector went okay. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Good. Those, if you, if it, I don't know what the rest of you cities are, but when, you, when you're getting inspected in Laguna Beach, it is a... Uh, Opportunity. An opportunity. <laughs> yeah, we will be polite no, until they give you a well, ruling. Thank, I, I apologize for that disruption. And go ahead, John. I, I, sorry sure. So sure. I'm going to sure. disappear again. I'm going to be going back to being my moderator role. And uh, I'm sorry, my host role. And you can be moderator. So I'm going away. Thank okay. you for coming back, Trevor. Sure. Trevor, we were just talking about uh, within stock market investing, how to think about taxes and basically just try to defer, defer tax realization. And the other aspect of that, is how you organize your investments. And I think it's necessary to consider your taxable accounts and your retirement accounts as two different areas and invest certain ways and in, in certain investments in each. So uh, for a retirement account, we try to generate lots of income because it's tax sheltered. And we're willing to have uh, more buying and selling, be more opportunistic in an IRA because we don't have to worry about taxes. But in the taxable accounts, we manage them differently in the ways I was just describing where, you know, we bought Apple in 2010. I don't plan to ever sell Apple in our taxable accounts because it's highly appreciated now, whereas we've been selling it in our IRA and retirement accounts. So, you know, a good investment advisor should think about uh, or you as an investor should, should organize your investments differently between your taxable and retirement accounts. I want to talk a little bit about risk and different aspects of risk. And the first thing I'll first thing I'll say about risk is I don't spend much time thinking about volatility, the ups and downs from day to day in the stock market as risk. I know it. I know it's going to be volatile. You know, there are going to be days where the stock market's up or down one or two or three percent. It's just it's just noise. It's just volatility. It only matters if I'm selling. So. The, the typical academic description of risk, they associate with volatility. My first definition of risk is loss of capital. 
permanent impairment where you know you have a stock that goes to zero or you sell a stock when it's down. So that's philosophically how I think you should think about risk. Other aspects of risk is stock market changes and it changes with the US economy. And this is kind of an interesting chart going back to the 1800s. You know, originally the stock market in the US was all about finance. And then industrial revolution, it was all about the railroads and then the automobile makers. And you know, if you invested a long, long time ago in the stock market, you were getting all financial companies were all transportation. Companies. It's a lot more diversified now. You know, you've seen the rise of healthcare at the bottom, the rise of technology. Um, it's nice that the U.S. market is fairly diversified, but when I started investing in the 1990s, energy was 10% of the market. It's 2% now. And so, um, you know, we've generally not owned energy stocks because they're, for obvious reasons, declining and relevant. So it, you should understand what's in your portfolio. And these are sectors. What is your sector exposure? You know, if you have all tech stocks, you've done great, but, you know, you may want to diversify because in the late 1990s, technology led the way, the dot-com years, and then technology stopped, technology stocks, the NASDAQ dropped, dropped literally by two-thirds in value, 65 70% between 2000 and early 2003. So you want to be diversified and you want to be aware of what your sector representation is. Why has technology become such a large part of the market? You can see it here. The orange line is uh, information technology as a sector. It's almost 25% of the U.S. stock market, and then and then communication services is another big one. That's uh, 17%. So a lot of if you own the S&P 500 index, fine, but just know that you do have a lot of sector representation in two areas: technology and communication services. And that's just the, the that's because the U.S. economy has has migrated in that direction. And it's interesting because it's at the expense of a lot of the rest of the stock market, the blue line, consumer discretionary stocks and staples, healthcare and industrial. So the U.S. market has changed over time with the uh, changing economy. So, John, if um, it's speaking to that, the so if you look at, let's say, the S&P 500 and, and what stocks are in that, w w w are you saying that a lot of those um, are weighted towards the tech uh side of things i'm saying about half of if you own the s p 500 know that about half of your total investment is in just two sectors technology and communication services and communication services used to be part of the technology sector so they're very similar so you don't own much in value or small companies the s p 500 is fairly concentrated among the largest companies, because the way the index is constructed, it's cap weighted, meaning the biggest companies count for the most by far. And, and the tech sector is, has really grown to be a huge portion of it. So the S&P 500 is, is good. It's, it's low cost, tax efficient. It's not actually that diversified, even though it's 500 companies, because most of the value is in the 20 largest companies. This is a fun chart. It shows year by year what did the best and what did the worst. So look at 2020 to the right. What did the best? The purple is momentum stocks, which are growth stocks. And then you had uh, cyclical stocks and small cap stocks. This is why you diversify because there's no pattern here. Year to year, different characteristics lead the way and others do poorly. So it's kind of interesting. Look at Look at 2020 at the bottom, value stocks. And we, we invest in value stocks. And last year was challenging for value stocks. They didn't make any money. They were, they were actually down slightly. But this year, we've been rewarded with our value stocks. Because if you look year to date to the right, value stocks have done the best 2021 so far, up 18%. So if you diversify, you kind of smooth out your results from year to year, because sometimes you'll have the best and the worst, you put them all together and you're kind of somewhere in the middle. And most investors, you know, would prefer to make six to 10% a year consistently than to make 20% one year, nothing the next year and have the results really vary. Um, this is what I was describing as far as the concentration in the S&P 500 index. If you're an index investor, um, 30% of your investment is in 10 stocks, the 10 biggest stocks. So it's Apple and Microsoft 
and Amazon and Google, the big tech stocks generally, they've just done really well. You know, you see the the increase in their weighting because the stock prices have gone up a lot. So um, we like to diversify beyond just the S and P 500 to to include stock market investments that are value oriented and smaller companies as well. And globally, we we want to invest outside the United States. How do you prosper in the stock market? So this is my other favorite chart. I show it to all clients and I say, you know, you're going to be mad at me every year because at some point your portfolio will have, will have lost money for a time. And that's, those are the red dots year by year since 1980. Each year, the red dot represents the worst period for the, for the uh, S&P 500 for the stock market. And um, last year to the right was a doozy. You know, in COVID in the spring, stocks were down 34%. But the, but the gray bar is how the year ended. And last year ended great. The S&P 500 returned 16%. So you should care a lot more about the gray bars because that's what you actually got at the end of the year. And the red dots were just a correction. They were just an interim period where stocks declined. And I want investors in the stock market to understand that you cannot deny volatility and periodic declines in value. You see it every year. And, and that's just the price of getting to good returns is the, is the fluctuation. So, you know, I don't think most, I think a lot of the stock market investors don't fully appreciate that their, their portfolio will probably drop five to 15% just about every year. And that's the red dot pattern you see. And if you're not selling, you don't need to care. And if you're not watching online every day, you don't feel it so much. So I actually find an inverse connection between frequency of looking at your account values and and making money because you know if you're if you're only look that's why real estate's great it doesn't get priced every day you know you don't feel the fluctuations stock market can be the same way you know look at your monthly statements don't go online every day i, th I think it's easier to hang in there and, and do well long term and as the chart says despite average entry year drops of 14 percent so on average there's a 14 percent drop each year Annual returns were positive in 31 out of 41 years. So, John, the um, the big drops, those are sort of events, right? In certain years, like the tech bubble and um, I think the, the Great Recession about 12 years ago. Is that what I'm looking at? That's what you're looking at. And yeah. um, we all we all tend to remember things that happened more, more recently. And investors that have been investing like I have since the year 2000, have actually lived through um, some really large drops, unusually large. So we had two 50% or more declines in stocks. The first were those bars in the middle. It was three years in a row the stock market dropped, 2000, 01, and 02, after the dot-com bubble. And um, we hadn't had three down years in a row since the 1930s. So it's very unusual. And then we have the 2008 financial crisis you see to the right there where at its worst, at its nadir, stocks were down 49% just in 08. And um, you know that was a really, really bad year. Um, but that's been atypical over a longer market yeah. history. And I don't, I don't think the next 20 years we'll go through big drops like that, let alone two of them. How, how do you handle it from a, a sort of, I, I assume when these things happen and you, you are look you know we look to you as our uh, sort of captain navigating us through the storm how do you keep people from just panicking and selling everything what do you what do you do yeah well if we've done a good job um any clients that that do need to withdraw from their portfolio for monthly spending or you know cash flow if, we, if we've set the asset allocation appropriately there is a component of the portfolio that's available for withdrawals that is conservative and will not be impaired in its value. And so that's how I think about asset allocation. You know, I'm 50 years old. I don't draw my accounts. I'm all in stocks. My parents are in their mid seventies. They draw $3,500 a month. They have a conservative portion and then they own mostly all the same stocks I own. And when COVID hit and the stock market was off a third, we didn't sell stocks for my parents. We withdrew from their fixed income that was not down in value. So, 
I think each investor needs to understand what they might need from their portfolio the next few years and have that portion more conservatively invested. So that's part of it, asset allocation. The other part of it is, you know, market timing is difficult. You have to get get it right when you sell and then you have to get back in. And we had clients that joined us last year that had gotten out in the beginning of COVID, but they never got back in. And, you know, by the end of the year, they regretted that. So most of the time, we just ride through the volatility and recommend clients and people who are investing do the same, you know, accept those red dot declines on this page um, and just know the odds are in your favor of long term. We employ active management and part of that means a few times in my career we have raised cash. And one of the times we had a lot of cash in our stock portfolio was in the year 2000 and it helped a lot. We, we did not experience the losses that you see there because we were holding a lot of cash and we did the same thing in the 2008 financial crisis. So, you know, I think it's, it's difficult to do it at home and we're thinking about it here all the time. And most of the time you don't want to raise cash, but starting out with the appropriate exposure to the stock market. And then if something really big is happening and we did the same thing with COVID that's, that's macro in nature and really basically, if you're going to see a recession, if you're going to have a recession, probably don't want to be all in stocks. And so if we feel like that's where we're headed, we, we some rarely, but sometimes increase our cash levels. But I say most of the time we don't go to cash. We just be a long-term investor and write it out. And why is that? This is another great chart to help you understand the probabilities investing in stocks. Going back to 1930 in the United States, what are the odds of loss? And that's what this chart measures to the left is one day what if you ask me am i gonna will you make money in the stock market tomorrow i'm gonna say i don't know 50 50 and that's pretty much what one day has been uh, the odds of loss in one day is between 40 and 50 percent you know it's kind of random but as you lengthen the horizon you go out three months two out of three three month periods going all the way back to 1930 all three month periods rolling through time Two out of three of them have been profitable. What about a year? You have a one-year investment horizon. You have a 70% chance historically that you were in a profitable position. And that's why you always hear it's about your time horizon. And if you're a long-term investor, a multi-year investor, the stock market is your friend and the odds are good. And, and so three years, you have an 80% chance. If, you're, if, you, if you can keep your money in the stock market for 10 years, you have a 90% chance you'll have made money. Um, we actually went through a 20 year period where that wasn't the case at the end of 2008 because you had had those two big declines, uh, but that was highly atypical. So, um, you know, that's why the stocks are great for the long term. Um, another way to think about the time horizon and the, the probabilities is, is this chart since 1958 to the left. You look at all the one year periods rolling through time and really wide outcomes. The best one year period since 1950, investors made 47% in stocks, which is the green. The worst year where they lost 39% in 2008. Um, you know, in one year, a lot can happen. Things can really vary, but, but, but your, your probabilities and the certainty with which you'll have a certain rate of return become a lot more firm when you look out five and 10 years. And so of all the five year periods since 1950, the worst annual return was negative 3%, which is, you know, you didn't make money, but it wasn't a disaster. So uh, one year, you just don't know. Five years, you can have confidence that you should have a positive rate of return or at worst, a, a really minor loss. Um, and then you see the average annual total return in the box. Stocks have averaged since 1950, 11.3%. We here have done a little bit better than that at about 12%. But even if you just made the average, I mean, 11%, you know, you're compounding your money every six and a half years. I mean, it's it's really really possible to do well with long-term in stocks, and you can see how that compares to bonds. Um, John, the, uh, a lot of I, well, at least from the feedback I've been getting at a lot of the workshops and the It's Your Money workshops, if people asking me about um, because it's come up, you know, new new tax plan perhaps this may happen, that may happen. They're talking a lot about the sort of Roth conversion and, um, and whether that's a good idea or not. 
and uh, so converting your traditional IRA into a Roth, let's say. But would time horizon be a factor in making that decision? Absolutely. Um, and I can talk about Roth conversions because we do them here. I'm a fan under certain situations. If you, if you stay at the same tax rate and you put money in a Roth and you withdraw it in retirement at the same time you would have withdrawn your IRA, you're really not mathematically better off. A Roth conversion where you take IRA money and you convert it to a Roth and you pay the tax that's taxable, that conversion, and you pay the tax outside of the, the retirement asset, so with your taxable cash, it makes a lot of sense if you have a down year with your income, such that the tax bracket you're in that year where you're paying that tax is lower than it will be in a normal year or in the years you would be withdrawing from your IRA. So that's the first consideration is what's your tax bracket now? What's your tax bracket likely to be in the future? I would think about Roth conversions this year because the proposal from Congress is to do away with Roth conversions starting next year. So don't know that that would pass, but all the more reason to think about it now. And there's a, usually a really good opportunity for, for investors that are between working and Social Security. If you have any years where you're, you don't have a lot of earned income and you're not yet taking Social Security, oftentimes investors are in a lower bracket. So, um, you know, it, the, the more you're able to keep the money in the IRA or, or the Roth, so that does speak to the time horizon. The longer your horizon, uh, the better the Roth is. And then lastly, you don't have to take withdrawals from your Roth IRA. That's another benefit versus an IRA where you have these required minimum distributions at age 72. So if you convert to a Roth and you have enough wealth outside of the Roth, the Roth becomes the last place from which you draw if you're able. And so we have kind of a hierarchy of withdrawal sources for our clients and the Roth is usually at the end. And the neat thing about it is if your kids inherit it, you know, then they have 10 years that they can take distributions from the Roth. So it, it can become a, an estate planning multi-generational tool. So for the right situation, a Roth can be really, really powerful. You know, I, I like to show compounding and uh, the, the power of it. And let's focus just on stocks, the green bars. If the annual rate of return is 7% is per year, after one year, you obviously have 7%. If you keep investing and you keep making 7% after five years because of compounding, making money on your money, you don't just have five times seven, 35%. You've made 42% because of compounding. When you go out 20 years, it's not seven times 20, 140, it's 301%. So another reason stocks do really well is, is the effect of compounding. Inversely, large losses are a killer. And this is just math. If you have a 50% loss, to get to break even isn't a 50% subsequent return because if you've lost 50%, you have half as much money to invest, you have to make 100% just to get back to where you started. And so that's why I started out talking about first focusing on risk and um, thinking about you know, not, not having large losses because they're very difficult to recover from the way that math works. So I don't think you wanna speculate, you wanna be an investor. I get asked a lot about inflation, and so I've included this slide. And this is historically in the, in the US stock market since 1947, how did stocks fare under different inflationary regimes? And you know we've had deflation sometimes where CPI is negative, and that's the blue bar to the left. Even with deflation where prices are going down, and therefore probably the economy is sluggish. Um, stocks did fine. These are monthly returns. Stocks performed uh, 0.9, almost 1% per month. So call it you know 10% plus per year annualized with really low inflation, deflation actually. And then the green is where we've been living the last 20 years where you had inflation between zero and 5%. Recently we've ticked above 5%, uh, but that's been the best where you've, you've had um, low inflation. It means the economy is expanding sustainably, probably. The Fed's not raising rates. It's kind of Goldilocks, the best, best environment. Stocks do really well. And I've pointed this out when inflation's been running 2 and 3% of recent years. And I've said, you know, maybe we will get some inflation, but there's room. 
CPI can go from two or three up to four or five, and we should be okay based on market history. It's the yellow when you get inflation that's running really hot, like it was in the in the 70s and early 80s, where you know inflation six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent annualized. That's hard on stocks, and and the worst is double digit inflation, like we had in the stagflationary, double dip recessionary years of the early 80s, because it, when you get that much inflation, the Fed has to raise rates. And when rates are rising rapidly, like they will be with high inflation, it's it's very difficult for stocks to prosper. Uh, the money starts moving into bonds with the higher yields and the value of future earnings are just worth less with higher rates. So um, you know, just keep in mind that high, high inflation is bad for stocks, but some inflation has is, is actually been fine. The, um... Inflation's in the news right now. I mean, it's kind of a buzzword all the time. How, I mean, is it something that people should be really worried about or is it, is it just kind of noise that the, the, the sort of financial news entertainment's using to perk our interest? I think inflation is the biggest risk to investors. I think it, it's certainly real in here. I received an email this morning from a friend who develops retail centers, and it's this really long list of the delays in getting all the building products. And there are months and even years to get anything and everything you see go into a commercial building. You know, we all can look offshore and see the 100 container ships. There's serious supply chain disruptions and bottlenecks, and that's highly inflationary. So the only question is, for how long does that persist? And it's viewed by most that it'll probably clear itself up with time, but I mean, I don't know. I, I, um, I think there's a lot of money. You know, this past year, stock and real estate values have gone up. That's spending power. And, you know, I'm paying $5 a gallon in gas. I mean, there is inflation, and I'm not sure it's temporary. And so we're starting to edge our portfolios a little bit more toward inflation beneficiaries. And so I think you want to have some inflation protection, real estate, gold, Bitcoin commodities. Um, you know, we just we just bought an energy stock, and we haven't had energy in our portfolio for ten years, at least seven years. Um, you know, part of that is what's going on. So yeah, I, I worry about it. The timing's really difficult to forecast. We could have an inflation problem the next year, or not for five more years. It's, you know, it's hard to say. The other concern I I get asked, well, don't you know the Fed's going to be raising rates? They're ending their tapering or quantitative easing. The Fed monetary policy is turning from stimulative to now, now the opposite, where um, policy, monetary policy is tightening. So I include this chart. Um, in terms of interest rates going up, the Fed raising rates, that probably won't happen until the second half of next year because the Fed's plan is first to slow down the bonds they're buying. That's what you hear this tapering because they're buying $120 billion a month of mortgages, of treasuries, and they're going to curtail that over the next six months or nine months. So the Fed, the Fed will be going, you know, in the opposite direction. The last five years have been very stim stimulative and friendly for stocks. But this chart shows the last 10 times the Fed raised rates tightening what happened. And the range of stock market returns is the, the green. So, you know, um, of those 10 tightening cycles, which is, you know, these are, these are months, so over four years of tightening. Um, in some cases, investors didn't do well down at the bottom of that range, but certainly the average w was a positive rate of return. Um, not different than the long-term average because it was about 40% over four years, you know, about a 10% type annual return. So, I just want to share that, yes, the Fed will be tightening policy. Historically, that's not been a big deal for stocks because you have to first think about why are they tightening? They're tightening because the economy is good, which means corporate earnings are good. And so it's usually a good investment environment when the Fed is tightening to a point. Um, I think the most important thing you can do as an investor in stocks is to have a plan, have a, have a strategy, stick to it, 
not make a bunch of changes all the time where you're going from big companies to small and then outside the US and then over to technology because this is a study of how the average investor did between 1999 and 2009. So it's an older study now. And over that period, the S&P 500 index to the left did 6%, you know, balanced portfolio did close to that, bonds 5%, houses appreciated at 3% a year. How did the average investor do that had all the choices of where to invest? They made two and a half percent because they made changes. You know, they, it's easy to, I do it. You know, you look backward and you get attracted to that which did well in the past, but that's the past. And oftentimes the best investment opportunities are about the future, which can be different. And it's just really difficult to, to time these things. So, um, you know, I, I think um, the number one thing you don't want to do is sell at the bottom because then you've locked in your losses. And so, um, Good for my business when people do that because sometimes decide they need a professional but you know you can do it yourself if you just stick with the long term and and don't get don't get scared away from stocks when you have the the bad headlines in the newspaper that's probably the best time to actually be owning stocks is when the news is really bad because it can only get better john let me interrupt you we have a question should people in their 70s get out of bonds with the outlook that interest rates will go up in the next few months Um, the classic answer is the older you get, the more you need to be conservative and being conservative means owning bonds. I think bond investors are going to lose a lot of money over the next five, 10 years because rates will rise. And um, if you own a bond and it's paying 3%, inflation's running above that. Uh, you're already kind of losing, losing after, after inflation money, let alone being taxed on it. And if interest rates rise, the value of your bond fund goes down. And so if you own a, a broad, if you own a bond fund that has broadly the U.S. bond market exposure, you know, that has an average maturity and duration that's between five and 10 years, maybe. And so if interest rates go up 1%, you lose several years of income in, in your capital being worth less. So the question is, well, if you're in your 70s, what do you do if bonds are bad? You know, you can put some money in the stock market as long as you you can can hang in there for the, the five plus years investing like I showed you. Um, what we have been doing is putting more money into real estate through real estate funds, uh, real estate lending, private markets. There are other ways to earn income. The preferred stocks I mentioned that, are, that don't fluctuate much. I think you have to be a little bit more creative and willing to invest outside the box a bit um, to create income and cash flow that's safe. And it is possible, but not through the traditional bonds. So, but you have to be a little little cautious on your liquidity needs, right? If you go yeah. to some of those other other more creative yeah. um, places, you do. And the and the fact is, it's just it's just the, the reality. You know, for money that really can't stand volatility or or potential for some loss, you, you just have to make nothing. I mean, that the yield for safe is zero. And that's just the way it is. There's no, there's no free lunch. Um, we can build portfolios that earn two, three, four, five percent. They'll, they'll fluctuate, you know, and and uh, you just can't, can't have both. So who should buy a, a tax-free muni? The highest tax brackets in California, you know, where you're, you're losing half your income to, to tax. It's the highest bracket, and we have, we have high bracket investors. In California, where we do own municipal bonds, they pay a percent and a half at best, two percent. Um, you know, on a tax equivalent basis, that's between three and four percent. Starts to be some yield, but but you have to know your tax bracket and you have to have a pretty high income for that to make sense. California helps make it make sense. Yeah, we're gonna have next week. We have all a whole um, you know an hour and a half on bonds. So it'll be interesting to see what the presenter has to say there. Yeah, I wanted to uh, articulate some some ideas around how to how to think, how to be successful, how to evaluate your portfolio or your investment advisor. You should be evaluating your net of fee, the bottom line results. Um, you should also, as I mentioned earlier, be able to evaluate it after tax, and and then you should be seeing your results, comparing them to a benchmark. 
um, and not just focusing on one year. I'd say you know three years is really a good framework. And so if you've never never ran your portfolio th through to, to see how it's performed, net of fees and taxes and against the benchmark benchmark, you should do it. And you should certainly understand what you're paying in fund fees or advisory fees because what's happened over time is fees have come down. So there literally are ETFs that were created five, 10 years ago that charge one fee and then they, they've had to lower their fees but they didn't do it on the existing ETFs, they created new ETFs. They're identical in investments but half the fee. And so advisors charged you know, one or 2% 10 or 20 years ago. And like I told you, our fee ends up at 75 basis points. So fees have come down and if you've not reviewed your fee and, and you established a relationship or bought a fund 10 years ago, you probably you may be overpaying. I, I mentioned mutual funds are not good investments. And, and this is active, active US funds, mutual funds in the United States. How did they do? And did they beat their benchmark? And going back to the style box, it looks at large cap, mid cap, small cap, US and you know, emerging market funds as categories. Look at the 10-year orange and the and the 20-year brown bars. That's the percentage that underperformed. So 90% plus of all mutual funds underperformed over the past 20 years. It's a terrible record. And it's actually even worse because the really bad, these are only funds still alive today. The really terribly performing funds, they get shut down, you know, because they can't raise any money. So um, this is why I tell you I don't, I'm not a big fan of mutual funds, and if you if you own them, um, I encourage you to give me a call, and I'll, I'll more thoroughly explain specific to your fund why it, it what what it's be charging you and the tax efficiency. Um, you know, I'm an investment advisor, and I view it as I need to to earn my fee. I need to deliver a return that's better than what a client can do on their own, and better than the index. And that's why we incorporate some active management and and tax strategies. Um, I've mentioned a lot of these things that I think advisors should be doing. One is differentiating between the taxable and tax deferred accounts. Really understand each client's tax bracket through time and make investments specific to the client's tax bracket. That's why I mentioned the municipal bonds. You know, we'll own them for certain clients, but not if they're at a lower bracket. Um, I talked about the mutual fund number three. Um, I, I'm really proud that we do things in-house because it, it, it cuts down costs a lot. There aren't a lot of firms these days that, that do that, but that's how I started my career on the research side. And others here, you know, we're, we're experienced with, with the research that's necessary to, to do things in-house and build strategies. And it gives us a lot of control over how we design each client's portfolio specific to their, their goals and objectives. Um, if you've never done a financial plan, number five, I encourage you to do it. Uh, most, most of our clients, we've, we've done that work and it, it gives a, a good, reference point for um, the ability to generate cash flow from a portfolio, how much can you spend, how much might you have to leave a, le a charitable legacy or for, for your estate. Um, it, it uses data and facts and, and scenarios and projections to, to really make informed decisions about how you manage your portfolio and how you spend and how you design your investments. Um, and you, and you know, that's something we, we do as part of our work with clients. It's included in the relationship. Um, and, and if you have an advisor, you know, I hope they're, they understand what, what you're looking for specifically and your, and your, and your portfolio is arranged around your, your needs and wants. And that's the advantage of having your own individual account, you know, as opposed to being in a hedge fund or a mutual fund. Your own individual account can be invested according to your specific needs. So um, coming up toward the the point I want to open it up for questions, um, but I included a slide about, about my firm. You know, I mentioned we're fiduciaries and we're invested alongside clients. And that's, that's, that'd be my number one question if you're considering and hiring an advisor. What do you do with your own money? And, and here I, I believe very strongly we should be investing all our own money, my parents' money, my children's money, my personal retirement money, right alongside clients. If it's good enough for a client, it, it should be good enough for us. And then um, I think it works well to be an independent employee-owned firm. That's that's what we are. So um, that's a little bit a little bit about us. Um, here's my contact information if anyone's interested in the portfolio review. Um, we're always happy to do those. We do them in writing, and um, 
pretty detailed, and I think you should review your portfolio every few years. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Do you charge for that review? No. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, they can contact you here and say, hey, here's what I've got. What do you think? That's correct. Yeah, it, we don't have marketing people. It's the best way we can demonstrate how we think and, and how we, my goal in doing reviews is to show a prospective investor how we can improve their costs and their, their tax treatment and hopefully their investment returns through a combination of that and, okay. and, and articulate how we would transition any investments to improve those attributes tax efficiently. And so um, happy to do reviews because it's a chance to, to give feedback to, to an investor on their portfolio and to demonstrate how they might be able to improve their, their portfolio. We had a question that goes but way back to the very beginning, but I've held it for now just because it didn't seem to fit in along the way. You'd made a comment that you know when you started, your minimum was 250000 and you've moved now more generationally. And so if someone under 40 wants to come to you, your minimum is $40,000. Correct. And the fee is 40 basis points. So it's a, a break on the minimum, a break on the fee for young people. So you're doing that to, to build. I mean, obviously, it's in your interest that you build now and have it keep going, but it's also for the good of that of the younger people who don't tend to plan that way and think in terms of what they do. That's right. Okay. And you know, I plan to be doing this for another twenty some years. So I want to, I want to be a multi generational firm. I want to, you know, keep keep it going. And and um, what I've learned is you never you never know how well people will do and what opportunities we'll have. And so um, being accessible is is to our benefit. And um, you know, a lot of these people that start out with $40,000, they'll achieve great things and be great clients for us over time. There's one question and I can be honest and tell you, it, it may have fit better at the time that it was asked because I'm not certain of it. What should ETFs as opposed to mutual funds? What's the question? ETFs yeah. versus mutual funds in what respect? What about ETFs as opposed to mutual funds? And I think it okay. came in when you were talking about no, that's a that's a good question, and I can I can address it from the standpoint of how we incorporate ETFs and mutual funds in our portfolios. Um, for a for a family where we're investing a, a large portion of their assets, we obviously want to diversify, and we take the taxable money, and we put in place a foundation that's passive on the equity side, and passive meaning we use ETFs, exchange traded funds. We do that with large cap U.S. stocks. We do it with developed and emerging market international stocks. And we buy these ETFs because they, they literally cost almost nothing. They're you know, five to 10 basis points per year. It's very low cost, very tax efficient. So we do it in taxable account. And that's the core, the foundation of the portfolio is basically buy and hold ETFs in areas that are very efficient, difficult to add value buying a mutual fund or even for me to buy stocks. Um, around that, we, we incorporate some stocks, preferred stocks, common stocks, where we think they're good quality companies. So we include individual securities alongside those ETFs. And, and a taxable account is a combination of individual securities and ETFs, no mutual funds on the equity side. On the fixed income side, um, we don't use ETFs because passive with bonds is not as good because I don't want to own every bond. I don't want to own the the lowest quality, most indebted bonds that are part of the, the index and therefore part of the ETF. I want to pick my bonds and, and just choose the safe ones because I'm just trying to earn income. So I don't like ETFs on the fixed income side. We, we do individual securities. But we own one mutual fund on fixed income and that's to get mortgage bond exposure because I'm not qualified to choose mortgage bonds. They're very technical and arcane and esoteric. And I'd rather have a professional that has you know, a lot of experience and a lot of assets dedicated to mortgage securities within fixed income. So we use one, typically one, one active mutual fund on the fixed income side. With a retirement account, it's a little bit different because we don't have to worry so much about taxes. So ETFs are somewhat less attractive. So we still buy our individual stocks. We still use some ETFs. We incorporate a couple of mutual funds in specialty areas like foreign stocks that are small companies where this particular fund company, that's their focus, that's their expertise. The portfolio is closed to new investors. Um, we're able to access it. And you know, it tends to be an inefficient area where a mutual fund might, might add some value. 
but it's very, very limited, our usage of mutual funds. We do use a lot of ETFs, and I, I think you can do well by, by using them, particularly in taxable portfolios, given their, their tax-efficient passive nature, especially in larger cap areas um, like the S&P 500 index. So um, in regards to helping, let's say you have a client that is retired and um, do you help them? Cause you're, you're talking a lot about, you have your taxable account in your, in your uh, let's say your IRA or tax deferred. Mm -hmm. um, it, do you help them sort of, you know, with the tax planning and, and how that regards to their cash flow planning and whether they would take capital gains income as opposed to let's say ordinary income. Is that something that someone like you would help with? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a big part of, of, of the effort is to, to be thoughtful about where to take income and produce cash flow most tax efficiently. Um, and, and you know whether it should come from the IRA or the taxable account or the Roth and the tax treatment. And you, know, you always wanna be generating capital gains as opposed to short-term gains or ordinary income for almost all investors. And so it's about, you know, about the optimiz we call it tax optimization. I mean, that, that's literally the name of our strategies for taxable accounts is tax optimized equity and fixed income investing. So yeah, I, you know, in California, the, the after tax rate of return is everything. Um, so, uh, just to that, to that point, John, just sorry. And I had asked the question earlier, of, did you help with the state plan? And I probably should have said financial plan. So as a part of the, what you do with the client is to set up a financial plan for them. We set up a financial plan and, and that's included in the fees. And that's included in the fee. And, okay. and the, the idea is to lay out for now and in the future, um, how much a client can spend and from where that spending optimally occurs. Yeah, and, excellent. you know, there's a balance because if you, if you have taxable assets and an IRA, you know, you, it's more tax efficient to draw on the taxable funds provided you don't draw down too much where you have a liquidity problem. Um, so we're, we're trying to really think about through time, the best way to, to deliver cash flow to a client. The financial planning is, is really useful when clients are trying to figure out if they can retire and how much they can spend in retirement sustainably and in the achievement of any other goals. Do you do work in other states or only in California? No, we have most of our clients in California, but we have um, we have clients throughout in a lot of states. Okay. Most are local. Most clients, you know, they appreciate the opportunity to come in and usually meet twice a year. Um, nice if it's local it's easy to do that and and go through this tax discussion and the planning financial planning and an investment review and um, so it tends to be more local um, Good. and we we mostly work with clients I think that appreciate the idea that we don't hand them off to a client service person <laughs> clients talking to my couple partners and me and we're designing the portfolio so should be knowledgeable about what's going on how many clients do you have do you have how many accounts um, do you handle? The 160, something like 150 to 175 relationships. Okay. Um, and I have two partners, so there's three of us that work together on the relationships. Okay. okay. Great. Well, we've, we've okay. answered all the questions that I see. So, yeah. Does no one out there has any other questions? We have uh, about five more minutes with uh, the great John Pritchard here. Um, <laughs> John, I also noticed that you, your firm, you, you seem to be quite a, quite a proponent of, I guess, kind of what we're doing here, sort of community education. You have a newsletter you write, it seems like by hand, meaning you don't subscribe <laughs> to some service that writes it for you. Um, have you always been that way regarding sort of the educating the community on these sort of things? I'm glad you mentioned that, Trevor, because we do write a quarterly letter to clients, investment commentary, and I'm happy to send it to, to anyone that's interested. Um, just send me an email and ask for it and we'll, we'll send it to you quarterly. Um, happy to do that as a way to stay in touch. And we write it ourselves and it, it is something that I, I believe 
can be worth reading because it actually says something and tries to speak to what's going on, you know, in the current economic and investment environment. We, we try to try to not just tell you what the stock market did the last quarter, but what's going on and what is it, you know, should you worry about it? And why are we taking more or less risk in this environment? And we try to make it accessible. Um, sometimes they're lengthy, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pages, but um, it, it, it's something we've written. You can go on our website and see that they're there every quarter all the way back to the 1990s. So we've been doing it a long time. And uh, like I say, if you email me, I'm happy to, to send those quarterly letters to you. If I come in and say, I'd like to have you review my portfolio, do you actually do this or do you pass it off to a staff person? No, I do it. I do it because, because you know, we get pretty technical about, um, I put the portfolio, so I need to get your statements, put the portfolio in a spreadsheet. I need to know the unrealized gain or loss. And, you know, I, I have sometimes people, I say, you have way too much appreciation. I, I can't help you, you know, here are a couple tweaks, but you really shouldn't sell anything. You don't, I, it, it's too tax punitive. Other times it's, well, you should keep this half. We'll, we'll set it aside, not charge you a fee because it's highly appreciated. But this other half, you know, why don't you complement that with these investments and here's what that would look like and here's how the transition would work and generate some losses for taxes or something like that. And we, we put it in a document, you know, five to 10 pages and, and email it to the person and then they usually come in and we go through it. So um, it's pretty detailed, you know, some work in it. And I, my partners and I do those. Um, I don't, I don't, we're, there's only eight of us here. So um, I end up having to do a lot of the different things that come up. Wear many hats. Yes. Yeah, yes. exactly. Sort of like Trevor. He's a, you know, building inspector. He's a, <laughs> I don't know. <remember. laughs> but I enjoy, I enjoy the reviews because the quest is to demonstrate that there is a, a way to improve the, the taxes and the costs. It's not always possible, but it, it's nice when it is. Very good. Okay, we're coming up on uh, 11.30. So, John, I thank you very much. Trevor, I thank you for, for spending the time with us also. Uh, this is the end of It's Your Money Week 6 on equity. Next week, we will be talking about fixed income. And I thank you all very much. And I'm going to turn off the recording. <laughs>